Welcome, Welcome to you all. And welcome everybody. It's exciting to uh, talk about a topic that uh, I've jumped into uh, with a lot of um, interest and, and seems to have a lot of significance even uh, for today, in spite of how the events I'm covering are over 100 years ago. Uh, I've been teaching online for about three years for West Shore Community College. Um, you see the logo in the upper left for my slides. I never thought I wanted to teach online, um, but uh, oh, about three, four years ago, West Shore had a strategic plan component that um, called for extension or upgrading of online instruction. And so I said, uh, well, in retirement, why don't I try something new? Discovered how much I like it. Um, it's uh, You can teach from anywhere, so if I want to travel, I can just find a... Um, uh, a Wi-Fi place and, and keep up with my students. But the best thing about it, uh, and, and I guess this applies to you, is uh, you don't have to listen to your students, you don't have to see them, uh, you don't have to smell them, and, and you don't have to watch them fall asleep while you're talking to them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, anyway, uh, it's become something that I'm comfortable with and has a lot of advantages, especially now. Um, so let me just go ahead and get started with the slides and then I'll be going back and forth between the slides and the uh, what I call the quotation page which is also up. Uh, here's an outline for the talk. The three visions are from these three individuals um, and uh, then the part four of the presentation today is okay let's uh, move a hundred years later and see where things are. Some of the themes uh, that these uh, individuals, these leaders uh, worked on. If, if I were to summarize everything I have to say in one slide, I guess this would be it. <laughs> I call it the, the continuum. And, and across the first row, um, and you see a kind of traditional classification of different types of uh, learning uh, education beyond high school. Um, and uh, the first category I call higher learning. Um, uh, you might think of this as uh, uh, what the world thinks of as useless subjects, uh, subjects that are pursued uh, because they're so intrinsically interesting and which do not have much any of any guarantee about uh, uh, leading to a career. Uh, uh, and uh, um, I put the quotations around this because uh, for uh, irony, I'm not sure after studying uh, the whole range of options in our program today that there's anything higher at all about these subjects, but they're traditionally called that um, even towards the end in the state of Michigan budget. Uh, we'll, we'll see there's a carryover from that. The idea of these subjects being higher really goes back to Plato um, and, and Plato also uh, relegated the lowest of three classifications of people in a, uh, in a state to those who uh, were artisans who practiced uh, um, what we call the trades today in the third category over there. Um, and somewhere in between um, in this traditional classification of subjects, you uh, have professional training, which involves a lot of theory, but also some implied stuff. Um, down at the bottom, you see our three figures, and I don't mean to limit any of them to the box they fit under, uh, but if I were to say, where was Scarborough's real passion? It was for what we call uh, classics and, and uh, the other subjects that, that we call higher learning. And um, Washington on the other end was definitely, he didn't want to exclude people from the the higher learning subjects, although he did make fun of people uh, uh, to, to, to a certain extent um, who pursued them, who substituted them, them he thought unnecessarily for um, uh, the, the manual trades which require training and the use of not only the hands but also the brain, as he put it. Um, and then I believe Du Bois, if you try to locate where his real passion was, also he didn't exclude people from 
um, pursuing manual trades. In fact, there, we're going to see there's a big part of his um, orientation that uh, considers uh, most of the race, as he put it, uh, as, as not fit for anything more. Uh, but his real passion was for what he called the talented tenth, uh, the people who had really high level um, uh, potential and talent. Uh, that's where he thought the uh, focus of education for blacks for their advancement should be. So uh, as loose and general as this is, it's a guideline to um, uh, it encapsulating every, basically everything I have to say in the rest of the program. Okay, any hands uh, coming up, Richard? Not yet? Not yet. Okay, well, part one, uh, Scarborough. Um, he was born in Macon, um, and, and all three of these individuals are um, mixed ancestry. Um, his father uh, um, was had a pretty responsible position, uh, I say his mother was nominally a slave. His, uh, the, the mother's owner really didn't pursue his ownership in her that much. He didn't, and he basically said, you're free to go live with your family and I'm not gonna give you jobs to do and assign you or confine you or restrict your, uh, your, your movement. Um, and uh, so, but because she was technically a slave and, and um, uh, Scarborough was born of her, he was classified as a slave uh, also. Uh, it's a very interesting story how he learned how to read and write. And I'm going to switch now to uh, the, what I call the quotations page. I'm going to try to. Yeah, there we go. So I've got a couple of pages of quotations from each of these three figures. The first paragraph under Scarborough is material about his mother and father. Um, but how he learned how uh, to read is pretty interesting. Uh, the highlighted paragraph, second paragraph, Mr. J.C. Thomas, a very peculiar man, intensely Southern, as a rule opposed to anything that meant progress or the Negro, that for some reason took an interest in me and taught me how to read and write. He goes on to describe the penalties for uh, a black kid learning, um, uh, becoming literate, uh, and how it was that he uh, concealed his book in his clothes as he went out ostensibly to play with his uh, playmates, but then, uh, uh, in fact, slid over to uh, get a lesson uh, from Mr. Thomas. Um, so uh, that's how initially he uh, learned how to read and write. Um, Let's go back to the slides. Um, he, uh, um, the war ended, uh, I guess, when he was about eight years old. He started at Atlanta University, now called Clark Atlanta, one of the historically black colleges and universities, um, and then went to Oberlin, where he really uh, enjoyed the rest of his education there. Let me slip back to the quotations, uh, what he says about Oberlin. I'm often, third paragraph, I'm often asked what impressed me most in those early days at Oberlin. I've always felt it was the strong religious spirit that characterized the institution, coupled with the personality of the strong individual characters there. And he goes on to um, say, conclude this paragraph, I forgot I was a colored boy in the lack of prejudice and genial atmosphere that surrounded me and enjoyed such life and amusements um, with others as these presented themselves uh, to us. He um, goes on to describe how uh, after first two years there at Oberlin, uh, several of his classmates uh, transferred to Yale University and encouraged him to do that to, with them, but he decided not to and how much uh, in later life he thought it was a good decision to remain at Oberlin for the benefit of the kinds of things he describes here. Um, so he gets a, um, um, whoops, there we go, uh, a bachelor's, master's degree at Oberlin, uh, some honorary degrees later on, and uh, 
1877, taught classics, but also mathematics at Wilberforce University. I'll be talking a little bit more about Wilberforce later on. Uh, married a white woman, Sarah Beers. Um, and uh, they had a long and apparently happy marriage. Um, and also in that year, uh, he published a textbook on uh, Greek language, which was uh, used at quite a few colleges and universities. And he became very professionally active um, uh, among classicists, but also joined the Modern Language Associations and lots and lots of other scholarly organizations. And he, in the highest circles of the, the Philological Association, he presented uh, scholarly works uh, on um, the nuances and the fine points of uh, Greek language. Um, I remember there was one of his papers on how the, the meaning of a verb changes from one uh, in the various places where that verb appears in Homer's Odyssey. Um, and so he was uh, respected in many ways um, as an equal um, uh, among other scholars, uh, had some outstanding opportunities um, to uh, advance the subject uh, of classics and also represent uh, uh, his race uh, to people who um, were not used to seeing um, a man of such scholarly accomplishments holding forth in, in, these, um, in these meetings. Um, he describes very vividly in his autobiography um, going to the University of Virginia and being invited to give a paper um, in some kind of hall or rotunda, I believe it was, where portraits of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee were looking down on him. And he imagines um, how, how much, uh, well, he imagines Jefferson Davis is just kind of wincing in, in shock and horror at the sight of a black man uh, uh, delivering a scholarly paper at the University of Virginia. Um, he also had some unfortunate experiences. There was one time when the APA uh, was meeting in Baltimore, and there was a dinner associated with the meeting at a hotel, I believe, and um, he you know, submitted a paper, had it accepted, but then was told, well, um, you're not going to be able to come to this dinner because uh, whoever's uh, the, the restaurant or the hotel is, is not going to seat a black man. Uh, and so he stayed away from the meeting and uh, had somebody else read the paper, uh, as, as I recall. He also noted in his autobiography a change for the worse in the uh, receptiveness or, or collegiality among members of the Philological Association. Uh, at, at first, in the uh, 1880s and 90s, he was welcomed and, rare, and did not often encounter uh, exclusion or prejudice. Um, but later on, as we moved into the uh, uh, maybe the, the, the 19th century, I'm sorry, the 20th century, um, um, there were uh, young white uh, philologists and classicists from uh, the South who um, behaved in an ugly manner towards him just because of his race and mocked him and discouraged him. And so it, the, uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, the, the atmosphere changed from warm and encouraging to uh, uh, kind of chilling and, and uh, discouraging um, over the course of the period that we're talking about. Um, but a remarkable range of scholarly accomplishments. There's a uh, relatively young picture of him um, he also uh, became active uh, politically, and uh, it turns out after he was fired from being president of, or forced out, uh, president of Wilberforce, he um, um, had campaigned um, vigorously for uh, Warren G. Harding to be president, and uh, Harding appointed him to a, a, a um, a job with the uh, agriculture department. Um, uh, he, after teaching for a while on the faculty at Wilberforce, uh, he was dismissed. Um, and, and he was, the way I interpret it is that he was so aggressive and 
uh, about pursuing his career and getting a national or even international um, reputation as a scholar, that uh, I guess the other faculty members felt kind of left behind or inferior. And um, um, so he um, had to leave his teaching post. Uh, these are some of the phrases that were used against him. And he said, yes, that was true. Uh, um, th there's a, a theological seminary next to uh, Wilber Wilberforce and AME stands for African Methodist Episcopal. It's one of the first black denominations to really get organized in this country. 1819, I believe is the uh, date when it got started. Um, and I believe Wilberforce is the first of the historically black universities and colleges. Uh, and so uh, in Ohio, it was, um, there was uh, a strong element of the AME church. I recall uh, growing up in the South, seeing AME churches, um, wondering what, what it was to be uh, Methodist and also Episcopal and also African. Um, it turns out that when it, church got started, there were not any churches in that denomination in Africa. It, they were basically being Methodist, but they wanted to um, emphasize the Episcopal uh, hierarchy of governance in that church. So it didn't have anything to do with the what we call the Episcopal Church in America. It was just a reference to the fact that the local congregations were under the supervision of bishops. Um, Anyway, uh, it was a hardship for, for Scarborough to be uh, uh, transferred to the seminary uh, because there was no provision for salaries for the professors at the seminary. <laughs> and he had to uh, uh, go around and get donations from people who were uh, supportive of the seminary and admired his work or thought he had something to offer, um, essentially to um, to to pay the bills for uh, himself and his wife, but he um, he endured that um, for a while, and then lo and behold, his fortunes changed and uh, brought back to Wilberforce, um, professor, and then a vice president of the university. There he is towards the middle of his career, or maybe a little bit later. Uh, and in 1908, he was uh, appointed president. Um, he was president for 12 years, did a tremendous amount to um, uh, uh, fix the finances. They were really all messed up, uh, built buildings, uh, got donations, uh, and helped with the academic reputation. Uh, he and his wife went to Europe um, three times, and he also... Um, um, did business with uh, several presidents. Um, we'll see that's a common theme with all three of these individuals. If they did have access to the highest levels of, of leadership, uh, presidential letter levels of leadership in this country. Um, and there he is. Uh, um, well, his fortunes changed again at Wilberforce. Uh, I believe, as I interpret his autobiography, and uh, Professor Ronick might uh, be able to straighten us out here that it was basically because he was not a clergyman um, that um, the board of Wilberforce wanted somebody in there who was ordained. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, he uh, was appointed by Harding, whom he had supported, um, to do oral communi or written communications for black farmers um, and then died in 1926. So that's a little bit about Scarborough. I'll pause there to see if there are any comments. Yes, there's one question from uh, Professor Rodnick. Oh, well, it's not a question. I, um, you've done a brilliant job summarizing his life. You know, one of the problems that um, was back when uh, the 90s when he was uh, sent over to Payne Theological Seminary, which is was only a few really uh, yards from his house. You know, Daniel Payne, Daniel Alexander Payne uh, was the founder, really, of that school, and he was run out of Charleston, you know, the AME church where the horrible shootings took place. He was in Charleston for years and uh, very, very aggressively teaching, and um, he was dedicated to the idea of having an educated clergy, and a, a good part of Scarborough's 
problem was the um, ambitions among the bishops and the church hierarchy running parallel to his effort to teach liberal arts classics. So that also is what happens in 1920. Um, uh, Bishop Joshua uh, Jones was really angling for his son, Gilbert Jones, who had earned a doctorate in Germany, by the way, well-educated in Jena. Um, but that's, that's an ongoing struggle with uh, uh, Scarborough. In fact, when he first became president, he wanted to make the commencements at Wilberforce um, um, better than they were, and he'd seen numerous ones in other schools in the East, and so he wanted to give an address, and his address on this occasion was on a line from the New Testament. Well, that just made the church folks blow right up. The bishops basically said, you cannot pronounce on a line from the New Testament. The irony, of course, is he of anyone on that campus being able to do ancient Greek and New Testament Greek, which is what he taught at the seminary when he was over there, uh, mm -hmm. of anyone on the campus, he should have been allowed to speak up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, thank you so much. That's great uh, detail on, the, on the, what really happened at that time. Well, let's move on and look at uh, Washington for a little while. Um, and uh, very humble uh, origins. He never knew who his father was. Um, um, but uh, as a child, just yearned for education. He saw the white children going to school and, and uh, uh, wished he could uh, go there too, but, but couldn't. Um, his... Uh, Mother married a man named Washington Ferguson, and who, who decided after the war um, to exercise his freedom by going to West Virginia uh, to work in mines there. And so he took the family. Um, his mother uh, didn't know how to read, but had an idea um, that, that how valuable it could be for a boy who wanted to learn how to read so much. So brought him some kind of spelling book or, or alphabet book and got him started. Um, his, he really, he argued with his stepfather um, about attending school and he and the stepfather in, insisted that he continue working. Uh, by the way, the, the stepfather took all the money that he earned and used it for the family, uh, supposedly. But he did allow um, Booker T to um, go to school at night. Uh, so after working in the mines for eight or ten hours, he would go to go to a, a night school. And when he first got there, he, he had never known any other name than Booker. Um, and the the whoever was in charge said, "Well, what's your last name?" And he, he was put on the spot. He um, um, said, "Well, it's Washington." And nobody knows for sure whether it was because of George Washington or his stepfather, uh, but. Uh, and then the T is something like Talifiero. Uh, he was later told by his mother that that was his middle name. Um, and, and so he took that on, um, but mostly just used the initial. Um, another big influence on him uh, as a boy was working for a lady, uh, Viola Ruffner, um, who um, uh, taught him a lot about what he'd never known growing up. Um, I mean, as far as cleanliness went, uh, he slept on a dirt floor. Um, his, his way of getting food was this catch as catch can. Um, uh, lived a sort of disorganized life. Well, the family life was just not very organized and methodical and wasn't set up to provide what people needed very well. But she took an interest in him, recognized, I guess, a kindred spirit in him. And uh, uh, just uh, drilled him on those kind of virtues, which he um, continued to appreciate for the rest of his life. Um, he collected nickels, dimes, and quarters from friends um, and just uh, put his um, belongings, meager belongings, in, uh, into a, a bag of some kind and just set out walking about what three or four hundred miles from West Virginia down to Hampton, Hampton Institute, which he'd heard about. Um, Hampton Institute was um, uh, 
founded by a Civil War Union general. After the war, he took an interest in um, um, educating blacks. Um, he, he, uh, um, General Armstrong grew up in Hawaii and his family uh, had a plantation and they uh, supervised Hawaiian, native Hawaiian plantation workers. And so he traveled to the United States uh, somewhere around the Civil War. And um, he was selected to command um, uh, uh, the, the units of black troops, divisions of black uh, forces who fought in the Civil War uh, because um, it was figured since he had experience of relatively savage people in, in Hawaii, uh, he'd be pretty good with the uh, uh, colored troops, as they were called. Uh, so he turned out to um, take a real interest in the people that he got to know in the Civil War and founded Hampton Institute, um, where Booker T. Washington walked uh, with nothing. Uh, but at one point in the journey, he was completely out of money and very, very hungry and uh, slept um, under whatever bridge or boardwalk he could find. He would, uh, got a little work as a stevedore halfway through just so he could eat, but he made it there. Um, um, just ragged and, and, and dirty and, and tired and hungry and talked to a lady there about coming, starting as a student there. And, and, um, he, uh, uh, and she said, well, uh, you don't look like anything like anybody who could uh, do well here, but I'll give you a chance. Here's, here's a broom, and there's a, some kind of building uh, or room in, in, at the school that needs to be cleaned, and so let's see what you can do. Well, Washington, in his autobiography, Up From Slavery, describes, I didn't sweep that floor just once. I swept it three or four times, and then I ran around and dusted everything three or four times. And he got all that from learning how to keep house or, or um, uh, manage uh, stuff in a house from Viola Ruffner, the lady who took him in and, and coached him uh, as a boy. And, and the lady at, at um, Hampton said, okay, well, I guess, uh, I guess you'll do. He describes for the first time sleeping in a bed that had sheets on it. Uh, and he didn't know what to do with the sheets. And the first night he slept on top of both of them. And then he finally observed the other boys um, uh, getting between the sheets. And he figured, okay, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, he had never taken a bath really or had a toothbrush before. And so uh, he loved um, learning about those things and getting into an orderly uh, situation with high standards um, and um, the, the other things that are mentioned here. Um, after three years, he graduated uh, uh, and uh, uh, went back to Malden, West Virginia, so that he could teach other blacks. And he also set aside night sessions like he'd benefited from for those who needed to work during the day. Um, Here's a picture of him giving a speech, and you can just see the power and force that he has as a speaker. He was um, uh, just um, gifted, and he practiced hard. He describes in his autobiography how fearful he was making speeches uh, leading up to uh, the moment of delivery and wanting to make sure that it went just right. But once he got up there, he was just unmatchable. Uh, and, and you can you can just see that in his picture here. Uh, he learned how to do that uh, because um, he was approached in West Virginia in a situation where there were Charleston and, and two other cities were vying with each other to be selected at the state capitol. And he went around making speeches by some group of Charleston advocates uh, for Charleston to be named, which it was. And, and so... Um, then he went to Hampton um, and we called back to Hampton to teach there for a couple of years. Uh, he was assigned to live in an Indian dormitory, um, had an interesting experience with the Indian students who he really um, enjoyed and became close to. 
there was some kind of field trip, maybe it was to Washington, D.C., where they went and they checked into a hotel, but um, Booker T. Washington was not allowed to go into the hotel. Um, so the different kinds of discrimination that applied to people of different races um, um, affected him in that way. Um, and then a couple of years later, um, General Armstrong received an invitation from one black, one white civic leader in Tuskegee, Alabama, saying we want to start an institute. Um, and, and I think the original invitation, the original overture was uh, for a white leader for that school for black students. Um, and General Armstrong wrote back and said, well, I don't have anybody uh, I'd recommend who is white, but I do have somebody um, who turned out to be Washington. And they said, okay, send him on. Uh, there's a picture of Washington with, um, on the left is a guy named Ogden, an educational leader from um, um, Ohio. And then there's William Howard Taft. Uh, and then... Uh, Washington, and who's the guy on the right? The richest man in the country at that time, after he uh, sold his steel making business to um, um, uh, Morgan, JP Morgan. Anybody know? That's Andrew Carnegie. Um, and Washington, like the others, was very familiar with the highest levels of society uh, in the United States and very effective at getting uh, money from them. Um, and so um, starting with almost nothing, he describes how he arrived at the Tuskegee campus or the land set aside for it. There was something like a chicken coop um, in a, a crumbling brick building, uh, and he built it up through um, uh, the process is described here, uh, and he also very much followed the Hampton Institute principles of vocational training. Um, he became great, reached uh, uh, just an international level of great fame in 1895 when there was an exhibition in Atlanta. Um, and um, Let's, uh, and his, this speech uh, with the line, cast down your bucket where you are, really, really made his reputation uh, outside of Alabama more than anything else. Let's, let's uh, get back up to the quotation pages. Um, let's go back to General Armstrong, uh, the tribute that Washington pays to Armstrong. It's been my fortune to meet personally many of what are called the great characters, both in Europe and America, but I do not hesitate to say that I never met any man who in my estimation was the equal of General Armstrong. Um, um, he, he gives his philosophy about um, vocational education here um, in the context of the difference between being worked and working. Um, he was very strong on all forms of labor being honorable, all forms of idleness being disgraceful. Um, just kind of scrolling through here, he, he describes how um, under slavery, um, there um, uh, was quite a bit of industrial training for blacks. Let's see if I can find the, where I'm looking here. Um, just a second. Um, yes, the, the paragraph the, the, that's at the top now. Under slavery, in most cases, if a Southern white man wanted a house built, he consulted a Negro mechanic about the plan, about the actual building of the structure. If he wanted a suit of clothes made, he went to a Negro tailor. For shoes, he went to a shoemaker of the same race. In a certain way, every slave plantation of the South was an industrial school. On these plantations, young colored men um, and women were constantly being trained, not only as farmers, but carpenters, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, brick masons, engineers, cooks, laundresses, sewing women, housekeepers. Um, 
Then what happened after the war and, and liberation, emancipation for blacks, is that uh, it, it was, in some ways, it was very good, especially for blacks, but in some ways it was not so good because the, um, the, the opportunity and really the, the impetus to learn these trades just kind of uh, waned away. Um, and people who knew these trades just gradually got older. And the, he notes that the emphasis at that time was moving towards um, uh, what we call higher education, Latin and Greek, and um, the trades were just being forgotten about. It was also calamitous, he says, for the whites who had never been used to working at all and didn't know anything about br brick masonry and, and shoemaking and farming or anything like that. Um, and so you had a situation where Blacks were being drawn away to the higher education, losing their man, their skill in the manual trades, and whites were uh, used to looking down on labor of any kind. And so that was a lot of the context for the industrial training. Um, the cast down your bucket speech, uh, it's just a masterpiece of oratory. Um, a ship lost at sea for many days, suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. The mast of the unfortunate vessel was seen a signal, water, water, we die of thirst. The answer came back, cast down your bucket where you are. It goes back and forth several times. And finally, the captain of the distressed vessel uh, heeds the injunction and puts his bucket down. It turns out they're at the mouth of the Amazon River and the water right there um, is uh, uh, potable. Uh, and, and it solves the problem. And so he takes this as a metaphor for what both blacks and whites should do. To those of my weight race, cast down your bucket where you are. Try do it by making friends in every manly way. Let me pause for the word manly here because the way in which slavery emasculated, especially black men, is going to be a strong theme with both Washington and also Du Bois. Um, cast, but make friends in every manly way uh, of the people of all races with whom we're surrounded. Um, and then goes on to describe the various industrial and vocational ways in which uh, Blacks can, can do that. Um, he makes fun of the higher uh, learning uh, fields, uh, calls them ornamental gigaws of life. Uh, no, this is a great line, no race can prosper until it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. It's at the bottom, we must begin, not at the top. Um, and then he addresses white people who he also said should cast down their buckets where they are, cast it down among the eight millions of Negroes whose habits you know, whose fidelity and love you have tested in days when you approve, when to have proved treacherous meant the ruin of your firesides. And, and he goes on to describe how faithful and loyal and even uh, emotionally attached slaves were uh, to, to their masters, uh, as, as difficult to understand as that would be. Um, the very last line here uh, that's highlighted. Um, uh, accounts for a great deal of the um, criticism that Washington took as being an apologist for, um, in this case, se uh, segregation and in, uh, uh, unequal treatment. In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. So the, the separation of the fingers and the hand um, was taken as an implicit way of condoning segregation. Uh, and it opened it up in other things that he said uh, to a lot of criticism, uh, as we're going to see. Okay. Um, I'm mindful of the time and uh, um, understand anybody's need to check out whenever you need to, but we've got a little more material to cover, so let's keep on going. Um,
there's Washington with his family, his two sons, um, his third wife. Uh, he was widowed twice. Um, uh, a big event, 1901, was he was invited by Theodore Roosevelt, he, with whom he had uh, a good bit of contact by that time. You know, Roosevelt trusted Washington as an advisor on all kinds of things, including black affairs. Um, Washington was in town. Roosevelt had met with him maybe a day or so before, but uh, then um, uh, Roosevelt took the initiative to invite him to dinner. Um, and that was the first time that a black man had dined at the White House. Um, uh, Roosevelt said when he wrote the invitation, he realized this could lead to trouble, which it did. And he and then he sent it off promptly before he um, had second thoughts and decided not to do it. <laughs> and uh, when uh, Washington got the invitation, the same kind of thing, he said, uh-oh, I'm not sure I should do this. But then he sent the acceptance off um, uh, for the same reason. I didn't want to change my mind. Uh, I just wanted to go ahead and be done with it and take the risk. Well, uh, um, Washington showed up at the White House at the appointed time, dined, had dinner with uh, Roosevelt and his wife and his um, daughter. The next day, the furor started. It was the most vicious display of racism and paranoia about blacks and whites uh, commingling on an equal basis uh, that you can imagine. Um, Senator Benjamin Tillman of South Carolina said that it would be necessary to exterminate uh, about a thousand blacks, though he didn't call them that, in order to, um, after this uh, breach of, of, of um, not only etiquette, but morality um, in his mind, uh, uh, just, just to show the blacks their place or teach them to learn where their place is. Um, and, and there were uh, other uh, not quite as vicious uh, 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 criticisms of, of both of them. In fact, Roosevelt, what, I mean, uh, Washington was advised by a number of black leaders, you should have known better than to accept that, that uh, um, invitation. Uh, it set us back. Um, well, uh, finally, uh, his, uh, he was, he spent a lot of the time on the road and uh, raising funds and advertising uh, Tuskegee. It was built up into a very powerful organization with a network all over the country that uh, people like Du Bois called it the Tuskegee machine. Uh, but he was speaking in 1915 in New York City, uh, collapsed um, uh, near death, went back to Tuskegee where he died uh, on the campus and where he's buried. I've seen his grave get to that in just a minute. This is a, a statue of Washington lifting the veil of ignorance off of a slave. Um, and you, you can see that the slave is sitting on an anvil. And what you can't see in this picture uh, is to the right of the slave is a plow. And so this is on the campus of Tuskegee University. Uh, it's um, and, and the anvil and the plow, I think there's another symbol there of, of vocational work um, uh, are meant to emphasize what uh, Tuskegee was founded on. Uh, and there are also quotations around the statue about the combination of working with your hands and using your brain and the skill that you have to be educated about to perform the, the best in the way of, of uh, practical arts. Uh, all right, uh, Du Bois. Uh, should I pause here, see if there are any questions, comments about Washington? Anyone? Just unmute your microphone. I wanted to say one thing about Washington. Uh, you know, there were many people very upset with him. There was an assassination attempt. Uh, you know, we see the same thing coming up with Martin Luther King. There was an assassination attempt by a black woman in Harlem with a letter opener. And yeah. so, you know, these men are in precarious positions trying to balance um, both races and all the issues flying around. 
um, when um, he died, Washington died in November of 1915, Scarborough was an honorary pallbearer. Uh, they were not enemies. You know, you would think, oh, they must hate each other, but it's not the case at all. Scarborough knew, knew uh, two of his wives and had invited his third to come stay at their home with his wife, Sarah, and in uh, Wilberforce. So there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a fascinating story behind how all these, um, these men and these uh, people had to, um, uh, you know, balance the demands coming from all sides. And of course, the point about Washington in the South, he, he needed to take that kind of action of uh, getting white patronage and, and not moving too fast, so to speak. The Du Bois, who's not born in slavery, like Washington and Scarborough were, is in the North. And he's really a generation uh, younger. Um, du Bois is born in 1868, Scarborough's 1852, and um, uh, Washington's 1856. So I just wanted to throw that in a little bit of background. That's good. That's good. Well, here's a little bit of background on uh, Du Bois. Uh, first uh, PhD from Harvard for an African American. He was basically in the field of sociology. Um, he, um, uh, there he is dressed up like a dandy, I believe it was taken in Europe. Um, all three of these gentlemen, um, went to Europe and, and tried to, um, uh, learn from the Europeans and also, um, 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 bring what was going on in the United States back over to Europe. Um, um, let's see. Um, here we go. There, there's a, there's a slide. Um, uh, when uh, Scarborough was fired from his teaching job at Wilberforce, uh, Du Bois went in there and taught a couple of years um, in his place. Um, he hated it, uh, mainly because Du Bois was um, pretty hostile to religion, and Wilberforce was a, um, uh, an AME, a sectarian university. Um, there's a story about one time uh, at some kind of meeting, uh, whoever was leading the meeting said, uh, well, Dr. Du Bois will now um, lead us in prayer. Uh, and and you know, Du Bois said, no, I will not. Um, and so he got out of there as soon as he could. He got a, um, a research job uh, applying his sociology uh, conditions uh, in, for blacks in Philadelphia. Then he started teaching at Atlanta University. Um, it's interesting, he uh, switched from integration uh, to advocating voluntary segregation. Um, and um, it, it's a bit uh, like uh, some of the separatists, uh, Muslim separatist movements that we've seen in this country. Um, I, I don't know how much of a, a similarity that there, there is, but um, uh, there was a, uh, in later life, he really questioned whether blacks and whites could um, get along with each other and you know, live in an integrated way. Um, he did, he married, uh, had a son who died at the age of three. There's the son and his wife uh, with him. Um, a prolific writer, editor of mostly, most famously, the Crisis Magazine, which was a uh, uh, all about black advancement and issues uh, um, in front of blacks who were trying to move forward. Um, 25 books, dozens and dozens of articles. He uh, originally uh, liked what Washington had to say at the Atlanta speech, cast down your bucket, but then began a, a sustained uh, critique. Let's look at some of how Washington and also Scarborough expressed themselves towards Washington um, let's go back to Scarborough for just a little bit. Um, um, uh, the educated Negro in his mission, human thought is like a pendulum. Uh, and he says the pendulum has gone uh, too far in the direction of industrial education, that manual training is needful. No one will deny. Um, it's only when 
a limitation is placed upon a race if the objection comes when one race is selected for more than its fair share of experimentation and so on. Uh, the danger seems imminent. Um, the danger lies in the tendency uh, to lose sight of Negro scholarship, Negro higher learning. Um, uh, the Negro scholar is an inspiration to his own people who need just such an object lesson as himself. The race gains self-respect. So it's only by doing the kind of scholarship that, that uh, Scarborough uh, exemplified that he thought the highest level of the inspiration um, uh, could, be, um, uh, uh, could be done. There's, there's one quote, yes, uh, the quote that's uh, highlighted now, um, he kind of gives up on most blacks as needing to continue for a long time in a sort of peasantry. And that, that word peasantry has a particular string sting to it because he, um, he probably has in mind uh, um, the manual trades. Um, and so he's um, um, apparently uh, relegating the people trained by Booker T. Washington uh, as still in a kind of a peasant existence. Um, he also talks about, um, um, in the next to the last paragraph, or the one at the top now, it's easy to ignore crush and crush higher aspirations, the quiet shaft of ridicule like uh, Washington gives when he talks about the ornamental gigaws of higher learning. Um, uh, uh, Scarborough regards as quite um, um, uh, destructive. Um, however, as Valerie said, um, uh, he also, Scarborough also um, uh, says, um, and, and I'll highlight a, a new part here, um, in spite of the differences, uh, Dr. Washington and I remained good friends who understood and appreciated each other's work when the danger point seemed past. In other words, when the danger of industrial education um, uh, running over um, uh, higher education uh, seemed to be past. Uh, let's look at now how Du Bois, by the way, I wasn't sure how to pronounce Du Bois's name, but there's one of his books that um, um, uh, tells you how to say it. It's uh, Du Bois is the way that it's phonetically. Um, so uh, um, Mr. Booker T. Washington, uh, he, Du Bois talks about Washington's um, narrow vision, and, and which he says is the mark of a successful man. Um, a focus on industrial education, uh, and he certainly supports what Washington does with Emanuel training, but there's a big but here. The hushing of criticism of honest opponents is a dangerous thing, and he goes on to criticize Washington for overemphasizing work and money, for accepting the inferiority of the Negro race, which I don't think is accurate, um, and goes on to say, so far as he apologizes for injustice, North and South, he does not rightly value the privilege and duty of voting, belittling the emasculating effects. There, the, the issue of manliness for African males is, is brought up. He opposes higher training of our brighter minds, which is not really true, in my opinion. So far as he, the South, and the nation does this, we must unceasingly and firmly firmly oppose them. So um, you can see where um, Du Bois, like Scarborough, were very uneasy with the type of education that um, uh, Washington was, was so successful in, in, in developing for blacks. Um, let's see a little bit about his daughter. <laughs> his daughter Du Bois wanted his daughter to become a, a strong intellectual like himself, and, and she could not have been less interested uh, in that. Um, the Niagara Unit movement was um, uh, something that occurred in 1905. It was a meeting of uh, elite black 
uh, intellectuals, and they went on to uh, found, along with some uh, white supporters, the NAACP, and their agenda was most definitely right now uh, end of racial violence, full rights, and equality. Um, the, the criticisms about work and money um, come in the light of um, how he pretty consistently opposed capitalism, uh, advocated socialism, and eventually, and later in life, he wrote a letter to Gus Hall, whom I remember uh, uh, as the leader of the uh, uh, Communist Party of America, uh, and, and, and saying, it's taken a long time for me to take this step, but I want to join the party. Uh, and so that's a little bit about his economic orientation, another picture of him. Uh, some stuff about what the university should do um, and the Negro College. Um, this talented 10th stuff um, is also important with, with uh, Du Bois. Um, it, it did uh, definitely um, um, uh, represent an elitist uh, function. Uh, the Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. Uh, and there's the second paragraph, the emphasis on manhood, uh, again, natural selection and the survival of the fittest. He, um, uh, social Darwinism was uh, part of the, uh, uh, the ethos. He's writing around the time of the eugenics movement. Um, and a, a, a kind of a harsh and probably unfair way of translating what he's saying is let's forget about the 90% who are never going to amount to much of anything. Uh, let's just put everything into developing the talented 10th. Uh, um, and uh, so um, anyway, that was, that was the focus of his uh, ideas on educating uh, for blacks. Um, he was a, a difficult person to get along with, um, uh, had his arguments with the NAACP leaders and Atlanta University, got forced out there. Amazingly, he lived till 95 years of age and died only in 1963. And it was the day before the I Have a Dream speech where he was honored by NAACP Executive Secretary Roy Wilkins right before the speech. So that's a picture of Du Bois, which is in the National Portrait Gallery. So what about uh, 100 years later? Um, don't tell Governor Whitner, but about two or three weeks ago, uh, I had some essential, let me put it that way, family business out of state. And I went on a tour of three of these universities, um, as much as one uh, could be had, which was basically just walking around the campuses. I uh, went to Wilberforce University, uh, which is still going with 500 students. It has a very um, a large campus with a lot of buildings. It, and as a college president, former college president, I wondered how in the world are they keeping that many buildings maintained with only 500 students? <laughs> They're mostly uh, concrete masonry units and concrete um, um, made out of concrete. I, I was not able to see any of the what looked like original buildings on the campus. Maybe there are some that I missed, but they looked like they were probably built 50 or 60 years ago. I also went to Fisk University in Nashville, which is right across the street from Meharry Medical College, which is a well-known black medical school. Uh, the Fisk campus, of course, I didn't speak to anybody and all the doors were closed because of the virus, but uh, Fisk uh, now has 800 students. The appearance of the campus there, as far as the building go, looked like, to me, uh, like a lot of old or older original buildings um, that uh, were would probably be ready for demolition. And they were kept up maybe as well as they could be with the resources available, but they, they looked uh, decrepit to me. And I also went to uh, Tuskegee, um, which by far had the most impressive 
campus and you can see a, a, a lot more enrollment too. Um, Tuskegee campus has a combination of uh, original buildings. By the way, the original buildings were built by the students and the bricks for them were made by the students. And some of the students at Tuskegee when Washington was there complained, I didn't go, come to college to get down in a clay pit and you know, dig up clay and make bricks. And Washington said, well, I'll show you. <laughs> he got down there in the pit with him and everybody shut up. And uh, Some of those bricks in the original buildings are, are still there and the, the buildings are well maintained there. Um, uh, similar story, Washington had some grumbling among the students when he was trying to get them to clear land to do farming. And again, he got out there with a saw and an ax and uh, demonstrated his willingness to jump in and, and everybody shut up and, and um, the work proceeded. Um, so um, it was really interesting and fulfilling for me having studied these uh, leaders to actually see the campuses, some of the campuses. Um, what about historically black universities and colleges? Um, were they're down in number, probably due to integration, affirmative action, the diversity trend. Um, there's some interesting research on students of color uh, at elite institutions. Now, some of that says um, that in, in, a, in a nutshell, so many of them come from poor backgrounds uh, and they feel so outclassed by uh, the rich uh, and, and, and flashy students who constitute the majority there that they really don't fare well socially or emotionally or academically. Um, uh, and uh, in this research also showed that at, at good, say, state universities rather than the uh, elite universities, um, they feel much better and they do much better and, and they tend to graduate at higher rates. So the whole question of um, uh, what's the best kind of education, the best educational environment for uh, people of color uh, is still, um, it's an ongoing discussion. Um, okay, here's my community college background coming out. Uh, in some ways, I think community colleges with the emphasis on workforce training um, are natural heirs of places like Hampton and Tuskegee, and also because community colleges uh, have a much higher percentage of minority and low-income students than universities. I remember several years ago, the leaders of the University of Michigan were in a tizzy because they discovered that 90% of the UM students came from households with six-figure or higher annual incomes. And what are we going to do about this? Well, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I don't know what they did, uh, but uh, or, or I know some of it, but not all of it. But um, in community colleges, you have uh, more racial uh, and economic diversity than you do at universities. And so that's why I consider community colleges to be carrying on some of this work. A um, little stuff, a little bit of material on ACC. When I came to ACC, I was told in the original buildings, uh, Van Leer Hall on one side of Johnson Street, Besser Tech on the other side, that was a way of keeping the, pe the faculty in the arts and sciences away from the technical faculty and vice versa. <laughs> uh, but I, I have to say that when I was there, I saw a lot of understanding and respect for the two faculties. Um, in the state of Michigan budget, um, there is a division, there's still a division between the community college part of the budget, which is uh, oh, probably around 350 uh, million a year for 28 community colleges, and uh, the higher education budget, which is for the 15 public universities, uh, and that amounts to probably, uh, probably today over $2 billion. Uh, um, so uh, this has been pretty long, but um, if your appetite has been whetted, uh, uh, first of all, I would recommend um, the, the edition of the autobiography of William Sanders Scarborough by our participant, uh, Dr. Ronick. If you want to read one book by Du Bois, I'd recommend The Souls of Black Folks. 
um, and Up from Slavery, by which is the second autobiography that Booker T. Washington wrote. Um, he wrote, a, wrote one and then decided he could do better, so he wrote uh, the most well-known one. Uh, but all three of those have been uh, very influential in what I presented you. Um, and then there's some recent scholarship by Professor Ronick, um, and maybe I'll invite her to comment on them, but I did want to show you the um, uh, uh, promotional brochure for Scarborough's um, Greek uh, textbook, um, uh, which is edited by uh, Dr. Ronick. And um, first lessons in Greek. Uh, so she has gone through much, I guess, like she did with the uh, autobiography and, and presented the material in a way that's accessible for uh, people uh, today. Um, so uh, one more slide and then if Dr. Ronick, if you'd like to comment on uh, these features of your recent scholarship, that would be welcome. Um, a Harvard exhibit, uh, an article on teachers of Latin and Greek for Africans. Uh, final slide, additional comments. If you want uh, the slides, quotations, or uh, the publications from Dr. Ronick, um, here's my email. And um, uh, open it up for anybody who wants to say um, uh, anything. Uh, starting with you, Dr. Ronick, let, I'd like to invite you to go first if you want to. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how to get the camera back on. I was going to hold up a picture. Okay. Let's see. Um, uh, Richard can probably. Under participants, no, invite. No, that doesn't help. Oh, wait, I see. I got the camera. I think I can do it. I think I can do it. Um, I don't know. Maybe I can't. I can't seem to get the camera thing to go on. Um, anyway, well, if I can show the pictures right now, that's all right. Uh, the Greek textbook I lobbied for quite a long time. Um, uh, there I am. Let's see if I can get there. Am I showing up? Hmm, I don't... No. That's all right. That's all right. I'll just talk a little bit. The Greek textbook is a really rare book. So if you should ever see on a used bookshelf something called First Lessons in Greek, and it's Scarborough, uh, there are only eight or nine copies left in the world. When I, I started lobbying to get this reprinted, because, of course, those who scoff at his achievement would say things like, oh, it could only be a few pages long, or, you know, it must be a terrible book. So I was delighted to have this because now it can go back into classrooms and very easily um, someone could just point out that there's a rich tradition of African-American work in Greek and Latin in this country. And in fact, it's Greek and Latin that got Du Bois into Harvard, by the way, um, when he went to high school at the Great Barrington High School in uh, Massachusetts, his principal, Frank Hosmer, knew he was a bright lad and also knew that he needed to keep taking Greek and Latin. And Du Bois will say in a uh, later autobiographical account that he listened to the man, Hosmer, his principal, but, and that at the time he had no idea that the gates to higher learning were barred by Greek and Latin. And so to get into Harvard, he remediated by studying at Fisk University uh, t teaching even Cicero in the summer. He had a Greek teacher who was white uh, named Adam Spence, who became a dean, Adam K. Spence. He came out of Michigan. And he had a Latin teacher, Helen Clarissa Morgan, who came out of Oberlin. And they both wrote letters for him to get into Harvard. And so his springboard to his later work, getting the first PhD given to a black person at Harvard in 1895, is coming out of this classical um, uh, background. Does anyone have questions or do you want me to stop blathering on? I've, I could go on for hours probably. Um, the photo installation, if you look up, uh, if you're interested, the Center for Hellenic Studies, which is sponsored by Harvard at um, in Washington, D.C., has had up 
my photo installation, which actually made its debut in 2003 in Detroit. Um, it was there, the very large panels done with advice from the Detroit Institute of Arts for hmm, almost two years. And then I added some photos and they now have a beautiful uh, wall mosaic of 18 photos of African-Americans who were involved in classics, teaching classics. Uh, even two women are in the mix. Um, Helen Chestnut, the daughter of the famous novelist, is one. And so now their faces are familiar. And the point of doing that, of course, was not only finding them, because people did not know about Black people uh, in doing Greek and Latin when I started looking at this in the 90s, but that uh, it's a lot harder to, if you are have residual racism, to look at their faces and sort of say, well, you don't count. Um, they do. There's fabulous first, the first Black person to graduate from Harvard, or the uh, first Black person to get a doctorate in Latin in this country, it's Syracuse, 1893. So there's, it's, it's a very fascinating way of not only doing classics, because my PhD is on Cicero, but also American history, American educational history. And in fact, I'll close on this note, uh, the textbook that Scarborough issued in 1881 uh, was a revolution because at the time, many people, first, if you're a Booker T. Washingtonite, uh, you don't need Greek and Latin, but there were others who, uh, whether they were uh, filled with uh, sort of dark thoughts or not, just thought maybe a person right out of slavery could never handle studying Greek or Latin or French or German, and we can add an, on and on with that. But the textbook is part of the first traditions of African Americans writing textbooks. And so Helen Chestnut, whom I just mentioned, published a Latin textbook with two other colleagues uh, in Ohio, and it was in the 30s, and it went through several uh, different editions. It was quite popular. It was reviewed in classical journals. Uh, no mention was ever made that she was of African descent. In fact, you wouldn't know. In fact, if you looked at either of these books, hers or Scarborough's, there's no point in, in which they say something like that. The only clue in Scarborough's is that he signed the uh, foreword as being written at Wilberforce. So if you know what Wilberforce is, you'll get it. Have, have any of you questions? Anybody have questions? All right. Well, uh, thanks for everybody for uh, participating. I uh, enjoyed this uh, uh, study very much, and uh, uh, it's great to see uh, the people participating. Thank you very much, Olin. We've got a few people here in a second. We've got a message coming through. Ron Young says thank you on the chat bar. For those of you who forgot to un how to unmute your your microphone, move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen and go to the far left. Those of you who have other devices, tap on your screen and go to the far left and click on the microphone. Bravo, great job, Olin. All right, thank you. And he's over there, I don't think I've ever missed one of your presentations. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. That was, that was uh, Denny Dubeck. Denny, talk up at your microphone. Oh. We have a question from Jodine. Not a question. I don't know if you can hear me. You yeah. can. I just wanted to say, Dr. Joyton, you probably have no idea how comforting it is to hear your voice. Oh, well, thank you. It's nice to hear and see every uh, see my friends in, in in Alpena. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other comments? 
Well, I just want to say that it was fabulous to know that um, that um, uh, this was going to happen today. I had gone up to Alpina uh, years and years ago, and it was 14 years ago, I think. And so I'm just delighted, absolutely delighted. I, I was so happy to see Alpina and have the chance to meet everyone up there. So this is a blast from the past, to use the popular phrase. That's great. Uh, your contributions were uh, really enriched the program a lot, Michelle. Thank you so much. Yes, it helped uh, have uh, lots of uh, perspectives on the subject. So thank you for attending. I'm delighted. I feel as if I'm the secretary for Will Scarborough. I must try to defend him. Because <laughs> he, he was, he, until I found his autobiography, which lay in Ohio for 80 years unpublished in Columbus, he was really left out of the picture. Um, he did have an obit in the New York Times, but he, no one really did the work to bring him back. Uh, I proved he was the first black member of the Modern Language Association in 2000. And since 2001, that group, you know, is very large, about 36,000 teachers of modern languages, including English, has given a $1,000 book award in his name since then. Well, they did not know who their first black member was. It's, it's just how, how strange that he would be uh, really one of the best known intellectuals of his day and so quickly um, sort of forgotten or, right. uh, I guess, maybe someone didn't have the, the backbone to try to follow him up. It took me years to get this all figured out. Well, Michelle, I've got a job for you. I want you to go to uh, Wilberforce and wake those people up about honoring Scarborough, because when I went there, uh, there was a, a tribute to W.B. Du Bois, and he was there only two years, and he didn't like the place. And there's another brass plaque, uh, naming illustrious uh, alumni or people have been associated with it and leading off uh, certainly uh, undeserved, certainly deservedly was Leontine Price, the uh, opera singer. Uh, but there's no mention that I was able to discover walking around the campus of Scarborough. He's not honored there the way that um, uh, Washington is at Tuskegee with a big statue. Uh, and Du Bois is honored at, at Fisk with a nice statue, but uh, uh, time, to, time, time to get Wilberforce to do its uh, duty of honoring Scarborough, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I've been an advocate for years. Um, the school has a lot of, you know, um, there's a lot of different politics going on there. And so, for example, one summer years ago, we went through the the librarian, um, head librarian, and, um, and one of her assistants, we went through every single book in the library and we found about 250 books that were Scarborough's or associated with his wife, who, okay. you know, his wife taught at, at Wilberforce longer than he did, actually. She taught till 1921 and was a prolific author of women's fiction. She's been entirely forgotten. It was known she was white in her lifetime and some modern people think she's black. So there's just a lot of... Uh, you know, he hasn't had the supporters, so to speak. He didn't get the support by PhD granting institutions that would say, do the work on Will Scarborough. So, for example, Professor Gates' teacher at Yale, John Blassingame, did the monumental work to get all of Frederick Douglass's, Douglass's papers published way back when, so that you can have access to what these men did. And Scarborough was just thrown on the sidelines. Um, it's... I don't know why, uh, really, why Wilberforce hasn't stood up for him. I know Central State, which is the campus you probably saw, because Wilberforce itself is really tiny. Uh, Central State is over by the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center. Part of its facility is the old Carnegie Library that Scarborough helped to open. Okay. It's right across from that library where his house used to be. And it stood until the 1970s until an F4 tornado or ripped it to shreds. And it had um, been the home of all subsequent presidents of, of Wilberforce, including the famous um, Charles Wesley, who wrote the important history of the Alpha Phi Alphas, which is the important black fraternity group. Um, it was put on the National Register of Historic Places and now it's under a parking lot. So maybe if the building had lasted, his name would have 
been there. But I think part of his, the diminution of his fame, he was not just a classicist. If you, if you see the Oxford collection, I, I published um, about 600 pages with a forward by Professor Gates. He has his hand in everything, education, art. He wrote one of the first profiles, as did, oddly enough, Booker T. Washington of the famous black painter Henry Tanner, and his paintings bring six-figure prices now. Henry Tanner was the son of a bishop of the AME Church. Yeah. But I think because Scarborough uh, was doing Greek and Latin and we're approaching the time of World War I and increasing racism under Woodrow Wilson, you know, that's Birth of the Nation, that film, you know, the rise of the Klan is coming everywhere. Um, and also the fact that so black people have done Greek and Latin, did it help us? Even Du Bois later on will, uh, well, not even, Du Bois is quite a mercurial character in certain points. He will really think modern languages are more important than ancient languages. Of course, right. Scarborough did both. But I think at the end of his life, he's a former slave, and people might have thought that he was sort of a th Uncle Tom, you know, trying to be a white man by working on Thucydides or enjoying reading Xenophon. Um, <laughs> I, I, but they perfectly misunderstood him. I, I also think his interracial marriage, you know, he was married to Sarah until death parted them in 1926 when he died. And I think it won him uh, and her a lot of antagonism from both sides mm -hmm. of the world. Um, his mother came to live with them after uh, Jeremiah died in 1883. Uh, in October, and so she came north, and she, they all lived together in this big Queen Anne house. It's a gorgeous house. I have a photo in the autobiography, and um, so she's there until she dies when the Titanic sinks, 1912. But you've got to wonder what they said. You know, you married out of your race, Will, or Scar Mrs. Scarborough, why did you marry this black man? She herself had a fascinating past. She was married at age 14 to a Union soldier, had her first baby the year later. Uh, it was 1866. Uh, her husband, who had come from the tiny town she was from in Danby, took her out to Minnesota. There she had another baby who died and is buried out somewhere in a tiny place in Minnesota. I, she, it's a little town called Keniston. Anyway, their whole marriage fell apart very quickly. And there is a note in her papers that she feared for her life, that her husband wouldn't support her. And so she went home with her remaining son, and she went to college after the fact. She went to the Oswego Teaching Institute, which was the hippest place to go to school with Pestalozzian teaching techniques. He was the, you know, the, the cool name back then. And it's that point, after she graduates in 1875, uh, and I can't explain how this happened. She leaves her boy with her parents, and she goes south with the American Missionary Association. And from that point on, her students will be, in the main, almost entirely black. She meets him at Wilberforce at an interracial high school. It's burned down after the vicious, bitter Tilden Hayes election in 1876. She had some sort of a little nervous breakdown. He went to try to teach in an AME school in South Carolina and was run out by KKK. He, do, he doesn't say, he says KKK outrages. He doesn't say what they are. 1877, they are both brought, invited to teach at Wilberforce, and then they'll get married in 1881 in New York City, uh, August 2nd. So uh, what, a, what a, um, a slice of American history is written into their lives, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Oh, Dr. Ronick, I'm curious, what has taken you down this path of learning? Oh, because, bluntly, classics is looked upon as sort of a, a white-only enterprise, and they, people see it as elitist, when, in fact, any form of education for centuries was always Latin and Greek-based. And when I kept hearing this back in the 90s, there was a big intellectual fight over actually argued by white people, oddly enough, about whether uh, Greeks stole from the Egyptians, what do the Egyptians owe to this, you know, all this uh, uh, arguing over what is really, you know, the Mediterranean is a, medi a multicultural area. But while I was listening to all of this, I, I wondered where black people were, because 
anyone who went to school until maybe 50 years, 60 years ago, you could not get into college without Greek and Latin. And so since there were educated black people who went to fine schools, Smith, Williams, Harvard, uh, Syracuse, uh, uh, Amherst College, um, you can name them more and more, uh, uh, that's just a sample. But because I know they went to these schools, I assumed there had to be black classicists. So that's where I've spent most of my days ever since, reading everything from the 19th century. And that's how I stumbled across some uh, short biographical uh, uh, um, pieces on Will Scarborough that said he wrote a Greek textbook, that said he uh, had been a member of the American Philological Association. In fact, he was a member for 44 years. And he gave more papers at that group than the average classicist today has ever given. I mean, he's an out and out intellectual star traveling on train when the meetings were held in the summer. Um, no sense of knowing if he would be able to stay safely somewhere. He usually ended up, well, often would end up with a prominent colored family, he would say. Sometimes he'd get turned away from hotel. Uh, he had a memorable incident at Williams College in the summer. He got there late. He was on the program to give a paper. Uh, he wasn't, uh, suddenly the hotels were filled. And so he asked if he could stay in the railroad traction shed, which I may be possibly comforting for him because of his father's service to the Georgia Central Railroad for many, many years. Anyway, so uh, long story short, the next day he got himself together and he went off to the meeting and he didn't describe whether he was uh, dirty or exhausted or he was in a rage about all of this. All he said that was to make this point about the ironic twist, uh, his paper was going to be on meals in antiquity, prandium in, in Latin, hence postprandial slump that you get after you have a heavy meal, or depnon in Greek. So all he said was on his way to the, con the meeting that um, he mentioned his paper, and then he said he knew what it was like to miss one, meaning missing his, a meal. I, it, don't you just love his heart? <laughs> yes. And, yeah. I, and I love hearing from you and all this information you have gathered. It's quite fantastic. Well, I'm so glad to share it because he's a pheno phenomenal scholar. You know, prof have you ever seen Professor Henry Louis Gates on TV? Yeah. He does that Roots show and he does all kinds of specials. A little bit. Well, he was absolutely delighted that I'd gotten all this work done. And he wrote forwards to the autobiography and then the uh, collection from Oxford University Press of Scarborough's publi published pieces, which took me a decade to find. There was no bibliography. And he says, if there is an antecedent to W.E.B. Du Bois as an intellectual scholar, uh, a public intellectual, it is William Sanders Scarborough. And he calls him the black scholar scholar. That's great. Yeah, I think it's great because we need a statue of him. He should be on a stamp. And I'm not sure why it's all so slow um, uh, um, in coming, that's all. And yeah, Wilberforce, you're quite right. I, there, there's, there's sleeping or something, I, I don't know. It also can be, you know, I'm not black, or at least ostensibly black. Although I've been told I'm an honorary black person now. I mean, it might be that I'm the wrong messenger, that maybe if I were a man or if I were black, not real sure, but I, I'm not stopping. Uh, in, I, I think Scarborough is a fabulous American, the kind that we can all admire for all the things he went through, including 13 years in slavery, however kindly it was. Um, uh, you know, he knows what it's like to be in a situation in which he would have to sort of play dumb or uh, try not to be uh, speaking out to us. Uh, uh, loudly. Uh, he never, for example, goes back to the South with his wife. And in fact, I found oral history, uh, and I, I found out finally who, whence it came, that until recently, there was still talk about him and his wife when they would leave Wilberforce and go into Xenia, which is the nearest sort of bigger town, is the home of Arthur Schlesinger, that as they got to the border, 
he would never go into town in whatever vehicle they were in, a horse cart or perhaps a car later on. He, he would go in by himself. So, you know, what does that say about the, 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 uh, the uh, hidden life of these two? Um, in 1913, there was an anti-mixed marriage bill in front of the Ohio legislature called the Reppert Bill. And the headlines in the newspaper, and he does not discuss this. In fact, he does not play up the fact his wife is as white as wife or any white or any of that. But this, and he says nothing about this. But I found this newspaper, and it said something about, you know, the big point headline was Rappert Bill, and then the smaller headline below said President Scarborough would be among those affected. It's 1913. He's been president of Wilberforce for five years. Uh, he's 13 away, years away from his own death. And at that point, if it had passed, it didn't, he and his wife would have been illegal. I mean, just literally illegally living in Ohio. Uh, and I have to think that they must have made a plan. You go up through Detroit to Ontario. I'll go up through some other city. We'll meet in Canada somewhere. And both of them at that point, you know, she's uh, one year older than he, they're not children. And can you imagine having a threat like that uh, thrust upon you at that point when you're sort of the leading lights of your school? I also found another piece in which there was a, a Wilberforce night fundraiser planned for Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, Taft coming from Ohio, as did McKinley, you know, all these big time politicians from Ohio when Ohio was really a powerfully political, powerful political force. There was this newspaper article about the, this fundraising night, and it basically said, uh, lots of people are canceling from this. They're not going to answer his, the invitation to appear on the program because they're afraid, and this is Taft, we're, we're into the 20th century, they're afraid that this would show that they were endorsing interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. What do you think? No, no reaction. I find it just no. incredibly, you know, again, they're at the top of their, their professions uh, and to have that kind of come out of the blue. Um, right. I, I mean, they must have, and there's, I have no, I, I, there's no personal correspondence that still exists. Uh, they must have actually, and she lived longer than he, <clears throat> he she lived to 1933. And I'm thinking they decided their own personal world was very private and the myriad letters or telegrams they must have sent to each other because he was always out on the road to these meetings or going to New York to try to raise money for Wilberforce. Um, I think they must have willfully destroyed some of these more intimate um, uh, windows into their, their life and how they stayed safe during this period. <laughs> It's a guess. I don't know. But you're all now deputized Scarboroughites. So if you find <laughs> something out there in a garage sale, a pile of letters at William Scarborough, pick them up. Because I have also, as I've done this work, things have turned up that you, you wouldn't have imagined would turn up. And once the name is known, and Scarborough doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds English, doesn't it? As a name, you would just think, oh, you know, Scarborough, who is this? But now you know, and maybe you'll find something. Maybe you'll find a, a packet of letters they wrote during one of these assaults. With um, knowledge comes responsibility, right? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, Scarborough, can you ad imagine, too, he's a little boy. He watches the Union troops take Macon. Later at Atlanta University, he will help tear down the Civil War fortifications as part of his school day. And when he finally gets to Ohio, he'll actually sit by John Sherman, the brother of William Tecumseh Sherman, whose soldiers and arm, you know, the guns and the, all that Scarborough heard and saw the remains of in Georgia. He'll sit by him at the first Lincoln Day banquet ever held in Columbus, Ohio. W what a remarkable change in yeah. position, wouldn't you say? I, it, it, it's just, it, it, uh, it's thrilling to me that such a life could have been led in that time. Indeed. Anyone else that have comments?
great discussion. I enjoyed it a lot. That's good. Feel free if you any of you want to email me if you ever have another question. You, um, my email's open there from Wayne State. It's AA3276. Or if you find some Scarborough thing, we must <laughs> do something about it. <laughs> Maybe you'll find a photograph and you'll recognize his face in the back of the photo or something. Um, also, there's a photo of his wife in her youth in the autobiography. You can see what she looked like as well. And they had no children, in case you're curious. Very good. Well, thanks again to everybody, and especially uh, to you, uh, Michelle, and, and uh, uh, ready to say goodbye.